This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access, the link posted in the first comment. That was the original title for the memoir written eight years ago. On the second or third page of the earliest draft, I made reference to myself as being a lucky man. After a few edits, I kept going back to those two words, and eventually they found their way under the cover of the book. They fit then, and they still do now. As the title for this new book, Always Looking Up works on a couple of levels. First off, let's just get this one out of the way. It's a short joke. At a fraction of an inch under five foot five, much of my interaction with the world and the people in it has required that I tilt my head backward and direct my gaze upward. However, this isn't a manifesto about the hardships of the vertically challenged. Frankly, my height or lack thereof never bothered me much, although there's no doubt that it's contributed to a certain mental toughness. I made the most of the head start one gains from being underestimated, and that's more to the point of it. Always looking up alludes to an emotional, psychological, intellectual, and spiritual outlook that has served me throughout my life and perhaps saved me throughout my life with Parkinson's. It's not that I don't feel the aching pain of loss. Physical strength, spontaneity, physical balance, manual dexterity, the freedom to do the work I want to do when I want to do it, the confidence I can always be there for my family when they need me, all of these have been, if not completely lost to Parkinson's, at least drastically compromised. The last 10 years of my life, which is really the stuff of this book, began with such a loss. My retirement from Spin City. I found myself struggling with a strange new dynamic. The shifting of public and private personas. I had been Mike the actor, then Mike the actor with PD. Now was I just Mike with PD? Parkinson's had consumed my career and, in a sense, had become my career. But where did all of this leave me? I had to build a new life when I was already pretty happy with the old one. I'd been blessed with a 25-year career and a job that I loved. I had a brilliant, beautiful, funny, supportive wife and an expanding brood of irrepressible kids. If I had to give up any part of this, how could I possibly protect myself from losing all of it? The answer had very little to do with protection and everything to do with perspective. The only unavailable choice was whether or not to have Parkinson's. Everything else was up to me. I could concentrate on the loss, rush in with whatever stopgap measures my ego could manufacture, I could rely on my old friend from the 90s, Denial, or I could just get on with my life and see if maybe those holes started filling in themselves. Over the last 10 years, they have, and in the most amazing ways. What follows is a memoir of this last decade, but unlike Lucky Man, it is thematic rather than chronological. Work, politics, faith, and family, these are the struts of my existence. These are the critical supports of my life. While not a strict narrative, Always Looking Up describes a journey of self-discovery and reinvention. The story is a testament to the constellations that get me through and give meaning to every area of my life. For everything this disease has taken, something with greater value has been given. Sometimes just a marker that points me in a new direction that I might not otherwise have traveled. So sure, it may be one step forward and two steps back. But after a time with Parkinson's, I've learned that what's important is making that one step count. Always Looking Up. I thought I was in rough shape in 2000 when I retired from Spin City. The twin hammers of producing and performing in 100 episodes over a four-year span had knocked me on my ass. Brain surgery two years earlier had reduced the emphatic tremor on my left side, but had done nothing to diminish the trembling on my right and in my legs. Titrating medication was a daily battle with a shape-shifting enemy. The segues between being on and off my meds, transitions that under ideal circumstances transpired like quasi-civil conversations, had deteriorated into a belligerent riot of interruptions and crosstalk. In a futile attempt to be on at the optimal times, that is when I was performing, I would try to get through my producing duties with this little levodopa, or aldopa, the synthetic dopamine that Parkinson's patients take to control symptoms, in my system as possible, so that when I had to act, I could up the dose and be steady in front of the cameras. Rarely, if ever, did I get it right. Getting it wrong, erring on the side of too much levodopa, brought on a torrent of dyskinesias, Uncontrollable movements like undulating, weaving, rocking, and bobbing. The cruel joke was that I didn't notice as much going through my paces as I did afterward when I watched the footage in the editing room. Having decided halfway through the fourth season that my physical condition would not allow me to do a fifth, I began to wonder if I'd even make it through the 13 or so episodes that remained. My daily regimen of drugs, which, by the way, have no psychotropic effect, no buzz whatsoever, affected my speech patterns and sometimes caused me to slur my words or hesitate before saying my lines. A real bitch when you're trying to time a joke. As for physical comedy, hell, I was just trying to avoid physical tragedy. Although everyone, cast, crew, and audience knew by this point that I had Parkinson's, 
I was still attempting to play a character who did not. Whatever comedic or dramatic complexity a particular scene called for, my greatest actor...